would like to say thank you very much and welcome to the first Flip Wilson special. And in the dressing room a few moments ago, I was sitting and I was running through my mind great quotations. I like great quotations. I've always learned a great deal from them. And uh, there were three that ran through my mind. One was the greatest quotation I've ever heard made by a woman. And the second was one that I'd written myself. And the third was a quotation made by a gentleman who I consider to be the champion of great quotations, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, let me do them for you, see what I mean? The great quotation, the greatest quotation made by a woman was made by a girl named Sarah Johnson. And it was made when I was coming in to do the show out at the Los Angeles airport. It was Sarah Johnson whom I heard tell the airline service representative there, if you can fly this plane 600 miles an hour in the dark and find Los Angeles, you can find my bags. <laughs> I heard her say that. I heard her. I heard that. I was there when she said that. <laughs> then there's one that I wrote that I consider, it has the potential of becoming great, and I think it'll catch on sooner if more people would tell their friends. My quotation says, don't order a drink for the road because the road is already laid out. <laughs> I thought that was pretty hip. Ben Franklin made the greatest quotations, the hippest, I'd have to say. It was Ben Franklin who said, it's hard to forget a girl when you buy her a gift on time. <laughs> I like that, now, that's, really a, that's really a great quotation. <laughs> Went by to see my minister yesterday. You know what my minister told me? He was saying how much pressure women are under from the devil and how the devil just hounds women you know that's rough too being a minister i mean he told me so you're coming here complaining about your problems and i gotta wage this constant battle against the devil i said yeah rev <laughs> he told me his wife came in the house a few days before and she had this box and on the side of this box was written the name of a very exclusive dress shop the lowest dress was 85 dollars that was on sale. <laughs> so she walks in the house and Rev says, another dress? You bought another dress? This is ridiculous. That's the third dress this week. And his wife tells him, the devil made me buy this dress. <laughs> Said, I didn't want to buy no dress. The devil kept following me. I was going down the street going, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the devil kept following me and he kept telling me how, Good I look. <laughs> Rev said, I'm not going for that. He said, every time you do something wrong, you blame it on the devil. He said, you blamed it on the devil when you ran the car to the side of the church. <laughs> it was the devil. You wasn't there. How do you know? He grabbed the steering wheel out of my hand. Rev said, well, why didn't you step on the brake? Said, because when he grabbed the steering wheel, I tried to kick him. <laughs> kick him and step on the brake at the same time. <laughs> Said, and we had a big fight. And that's why I was in the back seat when y'all got the call. <laughs> Rev said, well, how'd the devil get you to buy the dress? She said, I was going out of there. <laughs> and the devil sneaked up behind me. Sneaked. I heard him tip it to you, you know. I didn't want to look around because I knew it was the devil, you know. <laughs> The devil came up behind me, said, said, uh, say, mama, look at the dress in the window there. <laughs> said, that's your size, too. Said, it's on sale, too. Got a lot of them flowers in it like you like, you know. So why don't you treat yourself to that dress? And I told him, you better cut that out, devil. <laughs> I already bought two dresses this week. I'm not gonna buy no dress. I'm not even gonna look at it. The devil said, well, why don't you try it on? So they're not gonna charge, charge you nothing to try it on. I mean, that's free. You owe yourself a try on. <laughs> I said, devil, you better leave me alone. <laughs> and he shoved me in the door. The devil just shoved me in that door. He pushed me in the door. I said, devil, stop it, please. <laughs> Shove me 
over to where the dress was. I said, cut it out, Deb. <laughs> then he threatened me and made me try it on. Deb said, you gonna buy that dress? I said, I'm not buying no dress, Devil. And he pulled the gun. <laughs> Devil pulled a gun and he threatened me and made me sign your name to a check. <laughs> Griff said, well, look, said, how come every time the devil makes you do something, it's something for your benefit? When's the devil gonna do me a favor? And his wife tells him, he did already. I asked the devil about that. He said, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't even have a job. <laughs> Disappointed lady to do this show. Miss Johnson, I hope she's watching. And I want to, here I am, Miss Johnson. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't a matter of my not telling the truth when I told you I'd be here. See, let me tell you about Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson's the president of this ladies' club, and for years she helped me along the way, you know, because she'd invite me by to do club dates for a club meeting on Thursday afternoons. Uh, Miss Johnson's the president of this ladies' club called. You tell me what she said about me, and I'll tell you what she said about you. And she's president of the club. And I was supposed to do an afternoon affair for them, and I told I went by to tell her that I wouldn't be able to make it because I was coming to do the special. So I said, Miss Johnson, I won't be able to make it. She said, well, what am I going to tell the girls? She said, I promised them you were going to be there. I said, well, I don't know, Miss Johnson. She said, well, can you get someone to take your place? I said, it's too late because I got to catch the plane. I got to get out and do my first special. She said, well, what about me? I said, I don't know what to tell you to do. Then there was a knock at the door. And Miss Johnson goes to the door and there's two bums there. And the bums were gentlemen. You know, they weren't just raggedy bums. <laughs> I mean, these guys had a little class. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> the bum says, Miss Johnson, would you mind giving a couple guys who haven't eaten in two days a meal? Miss Johnson says, certainly. They said, in return, we'd be willing to do some work for you. So Miss Johnson said, okay, how about cutting some of that wood? So the bums go and they start to cut the wood. Miss Johnson's preparing the food. Then I'm watching and we're discussing who we're gonna get to take my place, if anybody. Then, zoom, I saw a guy shoot by the window. You know, he was doing summer tossing. So was that? I was wondering what it was. And all of a sudden he came back to boop, 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 boop. I said, Miss Johnson, there's a guy doing somersaults by your window. She said, yeah, she went to the door and she looks and there's one of the bums, you know, and he's doing cartwheels around the yard and somersaults, then he's spinning around, and then he ran up the side of the tree. I said, wow, Miss Johnson. Then he spun around the branch and he jumped back down to the ground and did a little ballet there like <laughs> Like that. He did about five minutes of that. I said, Miss Johnson, why don't you get him to perform for the club date this afternoon? She said, great, so I'll ask him. So she called his bum's friend. She said, uh, would your buddy perform for me at the club meeting this afternoon? Said, I'll give him $100. I'm surprised because she was only giving me 35. <laughs> the guy said, uh, I don't know, Mr. Johnson. Said, I'll ask him. Then he turned to his buddy and said, hey, Freddie, you willing to cut off another toe for $100? <laughs> I like motorbikes. This is a great new story I've been working on about a motorbike. It's about this guy. This guy named Charlie. Charlie got a motorbike for his birthday, you know? He was happy. Yeah, I got a motorbike. I got a motorbike. <laughs> and he wanted his best friend to see it, you know? So he said, I'm gonna ride over to my best friend's house and show him my motorbike. And he got on the bike, you know? <laughs> his friend lived next door. <laughs> <laughs> And he calls his friend out, you know, and he shows him the motorbike. And his friend said, yeah, that's always a sharp motorbike. He said, but uh, I bought my tennis shoes down because I wanted you to see my tennis shoes. And Charlie said, tennis shoes? The fellow said, yeah, he said, my tennis shoes, I wanted you to see them. He said, I'm as proud of my tennis shoes as you are that motorbike. He said, in fact, I'm willing to bet you that these tennis shoes are faster than that motorbike. Charlie said, are you crazy? How's a pair of tennis shoes gonna be faster than the motorbike? Do you wanna race? 
I said, yeah, I'll race you. <laughs> so the guy puts on a tennis shoe, Charlie gets on a motorbike, and people were going by up into the hall of the building, and they heard them talking about it, you know, and they went, they're knocking on the doors, you know, the apartments, telling people. So everybody started looking at it and went and said, tennis shoes against the motorbike? Yeah, right down there. I said, he gonna rate tennis shoes against the motorbike? I said, that's ridiculous. How's the man tennis shoes gonna meet a motorbike? So right down there. <laughs> and then the race started, you know, the motor, the guy on the motorbike starts up. Charlie started about 25 miles an hour. <laughs> Sometimes my lips get stuck doing this. <laughs> Maybe they'll cut that out. You know? And the motorbike's doing about 25 miles an hour, and Charlie's friend is running right alongside him. You know, he said, man, he said, you better go and start the race because a lot of people got their money back. <laughs> Charlie said, okay, so I'm going to whip it up to 45. <laughs> Snoring about 45 and, all, and his buddy's running right along the side. <laughs> then his buddy passed him, you know, his buddy passed him, you know, then he crossed over in front of him, you know, then he went back around him. <laughs> and the guy, the guy started running it backwards, you know, talking to him on the motorbike. <laughs> he said, you better get out of the way, so I'm gonna open this motorbike up. <laughs> then he, you know, turned the motorbike full speed. Ah! Ah! And the motorbike went about 40, 40, 45 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. Ah! Then a big hill, you know, a hill and a curve. <laughs> right around that curve, you know. And when he got around the curve, Charlie turned and looked, you know, he looked for his buddy, and his buddy wasn't there. He waited a few minutes. Then he got back on the motorbike and he rolled back around the car. <laughs> then he looked and his buddy's laying in the ditch. So the same, and he said, What are you doing in the ditch? And his buddy said, You ever have a tennis shoe blow out on you at 90 miles an hour? <laughs> Okay, okay, the story is about a minister. His name is Reverend Leroy. <laughs> Leroy was pastor of the church of the What's Happening Now. <laughs> I mean, Leroy wasn't the type of guy who would tell you what happened a long time ago or what's going to happen in the future. When you go to Leroy's place, he'll tell you what's happening now. <laughs> uh, the members... The members of the congregation dug Reverend Leroy so much that they got together and chipped in, all of them chipped in, and they built Rev a new tabernacle. Well, it was really a storefront, but they renovated it. <laughs> Changed the name from Barbecue Place to Tabernacle. <laughs> Put a big sign on the front, Church of the What's Happening Now, Pastored by Reverend Leroy. <laughs> now, it was the first day of the service. The day of the first service at the new tabernacle. It's early Sunday morning. <laughs> Down the road, on a path, leading through the zoo, comes Reverend Leroy. Now, this Sunday morning, the rain is falling down. Brothers and sisters, the rain was falling down, and the wind was blowing. And into the pouring down wind and the rain came Reverend Leroy. As he walked through the zoo, standing there in the cage behind the bars, looking out between the bars, it's a gorilla. <laughs> that gorilla, but on the cage, on the front of the cage where it has the name of the animal, it said gorilla. <laughs> G-O, it said beware of the G-O-rilla. <laughs> That's gorilla. Beware means watch out. <laughs> watch out for the gorilla. <laughs> As Rev passes the cage, he sees the gorilla standing there, leaning on the cage, digging out between the bars. Rev thinks that the gorilla is a man in jail who's had his civil rights violated. <laughs> Rev stops in front of the cage. He says, uh, said brother, said brother, why? 
Why have they got you behind those bars? Said, brother, whatever they said you did, you didn't do it. <laughs> said, you didn't do it. He said, because I know an innocent face when I see one. <laughs> said, you didn't do it, brother. He said, I know. He said, look, just look at the hair hanging down in your nasty face. <laughs> he said, brother, they won't even let you wash your nasty face. <laughs> said, look, said, they've even got you drinking out of a trough. Said, and brother, a man has to stoop pretty low to drink from a trough. <laughs> said, we're going to do something about this. Said, we're going to get the members. Said, I'm going right down to the tabernacle, and I'm going to get the members to get together. Said, and we're going to send a petition to Washington. Said, we're going to do something. Said, brother, said, all I got is one dollar, a raincoat, and a pack of chewing gum. <laughs> said, but you can have that. Said, I'm going to give that to you. And he walked over, dropped the raincoat, and extended his hand, which the gorilla clasped gently. <laughs> Rep said, uh, brother, I'm going to see you in a little while. And he went to pull back, and he felt the gorilla tighten up. <laughs> the pain shot up his arm. <laughs> down his back. <laughs> Rev said, uh, brother, I told you that I would see you in a little while. Then Rev heard his spine snap. <laughs> Rev said, brother, didn't I say I would see you in a little while? And the gorilla snatched him inside the cave. He twitched the bars. <laughs> Rep threw that small opening in the bars. Broke both shoulder blades, getting him in there. Then he cupped Rev's head in one paw, and he rained blows upon him with a 75-pound mass of hair-covered nut. <laughs> the breeder said, brother! He said, wait a minute. He said, hold it. And the gorilla snatched him by the neck. The gorilla had a handful of the man's neck. <laughs> a handful of neck doesn't leave too much neck. <laughs> Has anybody ever had a handful of your neck? <laughs> the gorilla took him by the neck and beat him off both sides of the cave. Then he slammed him around and slammed him down and jumped up and down and picked him up and flung him out between the bars. Rev got up. <laughs> Brushed off his clothes. He walked over to the cage. He said, Brother, said I'm talking to you. <laughs> said I'm talking to you. And the gorilla glanced back over his shoulder. The ref said, You know, said you're not a man. Said you act like a gorilla. <laughs> so that's the way you act. He said, whatever they said you did, you did it. <laughs> yes, you did it, and some more besides. <laughs> said, I'm going to get the members to send a petition to Washington, all right, to see that you get the electric chair. <laughs> said, and oh, yes. <laughs> said, as for that hair hanging down in your nasty face. I hope they keep you in there so long, it'll cover your shaggy car. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Fine, fine welcome. And it's certainly very gratifying to know that you feel this way and that you people have accepted my being able to sub for Johnny this week because it seems to have caused quite a bit of difficulty around here at NBC. Uh, earlier this evening, I was in Johnny's dressing room and one of the wardrobe mistresses walked by and she sticks her head in the door. She sees me and she says, what are you doing in Johnny Carson's dressing room? <laughs> Said if he catch you in here, this is the last time you're gonna be on this show. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very glad. 
<laughs> I'm very glad that you feel that way. We'll, we will, during the course of the week, find some way to overcome her problem and firmly convince her that NBC, without a doubt, has established within everyone's mind that it is the full color network. <laughs> It's fun for me. It's this, this entire week is going to be fun. I've looked forward to it. And, uh, in fact, to stand here and act so cool. I'm excited. No, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. In the dressing room, I felt good. I was thinking, you know, just different ways of expressing the enthusiasm. And I was saying to myself, Woo! <laughs> well, it's made me think back. This is a long way from where I started. You know, I used to work in a drive-in movie. That's right, it was really rough. But it was fun. It was a hard job, but it was fun. I used to go around and shine the light in the car, tell people when the picture's over. <laughs> I got $25 a week and all I could see. <laughs> I'd walk around and say, the picture's over, the picture's over. <laughs> I tried a lot of things. I tried a lot of things. I feel that I'm prepared to assume the responsibility for well, this job, this is, well, this job is like, uh, I feel like this job is like being at a weenie roast with me being the weenie. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw that in, you know? But, uh, yes, yes. I, I tried a lot of things. You know, coming along, I, uh, during my younger years, I tried, uh, I operated my own business. It was a lemonade stand, you know? And uh, it was doing pretty good. It, the way it went is I had a big sign over the lemonade stand called Flip's Lemonade, All You Can Drink for a Dime. You know, that was great, and it was going along pretty well, but then you always run into a wise guy, you know? One day a guy comes up to the stand, he says, uh, is this lemonade as good as everybody says it is? And I said, you better believe it, this lemonade is just as good as what your mother used to make. And the guy said, hmm, that gotta be some very good lemonade. <laughs> I said, and in addition to that, I give you all you can drink for a dime. You can't beat that. I said, let me tell you how I fix this lemonade. I put extra sugar in the glass. So that when you turn the glass up to drink it, the lemonade starts swirling around and that makes the sugar swirl and lemonade gets sweeter as you go down. You know, as it goes down, makes it taste better. And uh, then the lemonade is very cold. I put extra ice in the pitcher and then I pack the pitcher in the ice. I said, yeah, that's all right. He said, uh, give me a glass. So I gave him a glass. And uh, he said, I'll have another glass. I said, well, that'll be another dime. He said, now, hold on. He said, the sign says, oh, you can drink for a dime. I said, but you had a glass, didn't you? And I said, yes. I said, well, that's all you can drink for a dime. <laughs> People, people caught on to that pretty quick, so I, I kind of cut the lemonade business to loose. And I've worked toward tonight. And uh, during the course, now let me see, things are gonna be a little different with Johnny not here. The whole purpose of the show is fun. We're gonna try to have as much fun, you know? But other things will be different, such as uh, during the course of my opening spot, I'll eliminate Johnny's genuine, authentic golf swing. We won't have that this week. No, I wouldn't infringe upon the man's right to open, you know, that, that's not. That's his swing. You know, I swing another way. I got my own way of swing. <laughs> but uh, if, if Johnny's looking in tonight, I was thinking of some way. I don't play golf myself. Well, the ball is too small. If the ball was a little larger, I'd play. Uh, but in the elevator at the hotel I'm staying at, coming up on the elevator, I heard two guys discussing the game, and I thought it was a pretty amusing conversation. One fellow says to the other, he said, uh, say, George, he said, how's your golf game coming? John said, it's all right. It's all right. Well, I said, you should be pretty good. You, know, you and Freddie playing every other day. George said, look, said, don't mention Freddie's name to me. He said, I don't want to talk about Freddie. You understand? So don't bring his name up to me. <laughs> well, I said, but you and Freddie are such good friends. You guys play golf every other day. George said, well, not anymore. I said, well, what happened? He said, look, I said, do you want to play with a guy who cheats on the score? Want to play with a guy who cheats? A guy who, if he makes a hole in one, he's gonna take off two? <laughs> so you wanna play with, you wanna play with a guy who, who steals your clubs while you're watching the ball because somebody's already got your bag? <laughs> so do you wanna play with a guy who'll run through the clubhouse yelling, burn, baby, burn? <laughs> so 
you want to play with a guy like that? And the fellow said, heck no. He said, well, neither do Freddy. <laughs> oh. Freddy. not going to get any better than that, right? Uh, assuming that uh, perhaps Johnny might be watching this evening, I'd like to say, John, uh, I'm really having a problem with the wardrobe. You know that brought down the wardrobe I was telling you about last night? Uh, well, let me explain to the ladies and gentlemen. And see, the wardrobe woman actually resents me. When Johnny left, he told me that I should make myself at home in his office. His office was now my office. So this morning, I bought in my barbecue set. <laughs> I bought in a record player, some Ray Charles records, you know. And I invited over a couple of my lady friends. Then this evening, the broad down the wardrobe ruined the whole thing. Like she stuck her head in the door and she saw me and then she says, Johnny Carson don't allow no cooking and dancing in this office. <laughs> and the girls got mad and left. You know, well, I started to walk out myself. In fact, the only reason I haven't walked out is uh, the flying corporation and encouragement I received from our producer, Mr. Rudy Tejas. Uh, Rudy's flying guy, he's always encouraging me. He says, uh, don't worry about it. If you don't hit the commercial right on time or if you're a few seconds late with the station break, everything's gonna be all right. He's always been very encouraging. In fact, I met Rudy in Detroit last year. Yeah, he, he walked up to me and he said, take a television, they ain't gonna miss it. <laughs> Very it's always nice to have someone like that around. I have to say, I like to be honest with you people, you know? And I like to say that uh, being a young Negro performer hosting a national television show hasn't gone to my head. Uh, why should I let the fact that I'm in a position of power and of prominence and considerable influence affect me? I mean, why not stay cool? You know, I'm not gonna panic. Just be the same guy that I've always been. Uh, Ed. Uh, after the show, would you finish shining those other two pairs of shoes? <laughs> really, I'm having fun. Glad to have you back, Doc. I was thinking of what area I might have gone into that would have given me the opportunity to have as much fun as I had being a comic. And I thought about it, and being a doctor. You're, you're a doctor, right, Doc? I certainly am. Well, being a doc, doctors have a lot of fun. I didn't find out until, uh, you know, how much fun doctors had until a couple weeks ago. I was in a bar, and a guy was telling me about uh, his wife went to the doctor. She had a headache, you know? And she says, uh, Doc, I got a headache. <laughs> and the doctor said, mm-hmm. <laughs> said, I'm gonna have to give you what's called a thorough examination. He said, now, if you remove your clothes, and the lady said, what? Remove my clothes, said I'm a married woman. Said I've been married 14 years and I never removed my clothes in front of my husband and I'm not going to take them off in front of you. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, I see what you mean. He said, well, in that case, I'm going to make it easy for you. He said, if you'll step behind the screen, step behind the screen. So the lady steps behind the screen and she says, uh, are you going to turn the light out? <laughs> I said, but you're behind the screen. She tells him, said, that don't make no difference. <laughs> said, I'm not removing my clothes, even if I'm behind this screen without the light out. I said, wow. <laughs> then goes on me, turns the light out. Then the lady removes the clothes. You could hear the rustle, you know, over the clothes. Then the voice in the dark says, where shall I put my clothes? The doctor said, uh, you can drop them on the floor like I did mine. <laughs> So they're having fun, you know? That's the main thing about it. <laughs> Quite often, some of my uh, best stories are stories that have been given to me by people. The other day, a little old lady stopped me and told me a story. 
I like to do. <laughs> she said it was her favorite story. I knew it would be a great story because I have a very high regard for little old ladies. I admire them. I admire them because they're cool. <laughs> little old ladies are very cool. Very cool. That's how you get to be a little old lady. <laughs> You gotta be very cool. More little old ladies than there are little old men. <laughs> Anytime a little old lady tells me something, I say, yeah, little old broad. <laughs> well, let me tell you the story, then you'll see. I like it. Visualize a street in a large metropolitan area. Coming up the street is a horse-drawn wagon. Painted in large letters on the side of the wagon, there's a sign that says, ICE! There's a little fat guy driving the wagon. He's yelling at the top of his voice, he's yelling, Ice! Ice! Get your ice! A woman calls from the upper floor of an apartment building. She wants ice. She yells down to the guy, she says, I want some ice! <laughs> Ted, bring me a piece, honey! Ted, I want a 25 cent piece. <laughs> The guy cuts a 30 cent piece because the lady lives upstairs. No elevator in the building. By the time he gets up there, he'll be 25 cents up. I threw that in. The little old lady didn't tell me that. He enters the building, leaving a horse and wagon at the curb, which I thought was very practical. Well, no sense carrying that damn horse and wagon up there. While he's in the building, there's a fellow passing along the street. As the guy gets abreast of the wagon, the horse turns and says, What a life. The guy said, What'd you say? You know what? I said, What a life. I say that because a little fat guy who owns the wagon never takes the time to consider what it's like being the horse. He said, Five days a week, he makes me pull this ice wagon. And Saturday, he sells rides to the kids at a dime a ride. And Sunday, it's all day around the park, $3 an hour. That's why I say, What a life. The fellow said, does he know you can talk? <laughs> the horse said, heck no, and don't tell him either. If you do, he'll make me yell ice. <laughs> Have fun, Ed. Fun. Fun. <laughs> Why go away sometime, you know? Go on a little trip. That's what having fun is. Doing the unusual. I'm working on a new story. It's, it's, it's a sequel to The Days of the Nights. Remember The Days of the Nights? Yeah, I'm working on a new thing. Uh, it's about Geraldine. Remember Geraldine? Well, King Begonia. <laughs> King Begonia, who ruled the kingdom of Begonia, that's why they called him that, uh, King Begonia. King Begonia had two daughters, Geraldine and Ruby. <laughs> People saw Geraldine all the time. They very seldom saw Ruby. But they knew she was around, because every evening at five, the bell in the tower of the castle of Begonia would ring, and King Begonia and Geraldine would come out on their balcony there. And the king would issue a royal proclamation while the citizens below screamed, Hooray, King Begonia! Hooray, King Begonia! And the king would say, He who has nothing should have less, and that which he has shall be taken from him. <laughs> the citizens would scream, Hooray, King Begonia! <laughs> yeah, they, they saw Geraldine all the time. Very seldom saw Ruby. But they knew she was around because they heard the bell. Those who didn't know were asking, do Ruby Begonia ring a bell? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. That's 
right, last night, Friday night, and tonight, the highlight of our show will be your seeing Ed eat a chitlin on network television. <laughs> You're gonna eat a chitlin for us, right, Ed? That's gonna be coming up very shortly, you know? Well, later on, because that's the highlight of the show, you know? And uh, we got a lot of fun things happening this evening. That's a gassy jacket, Doc. That's beautiful. Yeah, that looks like uh, my riot jacket. <laughs> you saw my riot jacket, the one I got in Buffalo out of the window. <laughs> Tonight, what I wanted to do is, I hope it's not too late for me to ask you to join in my New Year's resolution, which is to try to get a congressional committee to investigate the pet shop owners. Those guys have been getting away a long time. I like animals. And uh, a couple of days ago, I was in the pet shop, you know, browsing around in the afternoon. I go in the shop. The shop specialized in birds. The guy that ran that shop was treating those birds like dogs. <laughs> While I'm there in the shop, a woman comes in. She says, sir, is this a pet shop? The guy said, that's right, lady. He said, it's not a hamburger stand. <laughs> lady said, do you have any birds that sing? The fellow said, lady, every bird in this shop sings. So before I take a bird in this shop, they have to audition. So most of these birds got records out. <laughs> lady said, if the bird can't sing, I don't want him. I want a real singer. And I said, look, if I tell you the bird can sing, the bird can sing. He said, come here, I'll let you see my best singer. So there he is. Bird can really sing. He has arrangements to all of his tunes. When he starts to sing, those other birds shut up and listen. Because they know that this bird got talent. He said, if I didn't really need the money, I wouldn't sell you this $300 bird for $8. <laughs> he said, and you're going to save additional money with this bird because you only have to feed him every other day. So this bird's a natural entertainer. He's not used to eating regular. <laughs> they said, can the bird sing? The guy said, you bet the bird can sing. So the lady takes the bird, runs out of the shop. Ten minutes later, she charges back in, runs over the guy. She said, I want my money back. The fellow said, what is it? She said, you know what it is. Don't act stupid. You know when you sold me that bird, one of his legs was shorter than the other. The guy said, I'm not refunding any money. That's your fault. When you came in here, you asked for a singer. If you wanted a dancer, you should have said so. 